Welcome to the Built Around You podcast, the podcast dedicated to helping you build, renovate or upgrade your home. Why is building a home so complex and stressful? Why do building projects run over time and budget? Welcome to the podcast Built Around You. On today's episode, we're mixing it up a little bit. Uh, Today we are talking to Andy Burke, who has bought a beautiful old period home built in the 1920s uh, up in Cantork in North Cork. Andy bought the house in 2017, uh, got a great bargain, to be fair, um, when he bought the house. Uh, But Andy has been living there now for some years and has noticed some some of the shortcomings in the house. Um, So he's here today to talk to me about uh, about the beautiful house he's bought. And of course, he has a variety of questions on how he could improve the house. And he's considering a building project himself. So uh, hello, Andy, and uh, and welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So I suppose, Andy, uh, before we dive straight into the house, uh, tell me a little bit about your backstory and what the situation was like be- before you bought the house. Yeah, so I suppose how we ended up in Kentork in North Cork was we were living for the previous nine years in Kildare in North Cork as well. And we had been driving past this house for probably over 14 years, going back to Dee's home house in Newmarket in North Cork as well. And we were in the lucky position, I suppose, where... We had our house sold. We were renting for over six months in a cottage and we were ready to go to buy a house. Now we had been searching every weekend, any free time we had, we were driving around looking for a house. And then suddenly this house popped up. So we were like, oh my God, we've been driving past this house for years and now suddenly it turns up. So we put in a bid and lucky enough, we got it. Oh my God. So uh, all of a sudden, you had been living in, in an old house. Um, you, you moved out of that old house into um, the, 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 a rental house. And yeah. so you had a little bit of saving from the sale of the old house and everything else. And the house of your dreams came up for sale. And all the problems, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's what today's yeah. episode is going to be about. Yeah. So, uh, so you must have been over the moon. When oh, we were delighted. Um, I suppose when we got the engineer to have a look at it, we knew we knew there were certain problems with the house. But I suppose the extent of it, we were we kind of shot a blind eye to it because I suppose we bought it with our hearts rather than our heads. Did you kind of see that you'd be doing work to it at some stage? Oh, we de- We definitely knew there was work had to be done to it. Like when we looked at the attic, there was fairly poor insulation in the attic and the internal walls or the external walls, there was no insulating anywhere. There was no ventilation in the kitchen. And I suppose the first winter kind of brought it home to roost that we were cooking in the kitchen and then we had to open the windows in the kitchen because all the windows were starting to fog up. Mm. Uh, so that's when we kind of said, right, we got to start looking and how we're going to fix these problems, I suppose. So you had you had insulation problems, you had ventilation problems. Yeah. Um, but but money had been spent on the house. I mean, oh, yeah. did, 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 was, was uh, what kind of condition was the kitchen itself in? Like in back in two thousand and seven, there was extensive works done. But I suppose it was all aesthetically okay. pleasing to the eye. But when you peeled it back and looked behind it, that's when the issues kind of rose their ugly head, per se. Okay, of course, back in two thousand and seven was the very summit uh, of the the Celtic Tiger Mountain. Yeah. Um, when I suppose a lot of things, a lot of investments were skin deep, and it was very easy to get credit from banks, and banks were giving you money for for anything. If if you yeah. were deciding to put money into your old house, you could. I mean, people were throwing money at you. Yeah. So it appears that whoever owned the house beforehand had the lovely old house and was just adding pure aesthetic, yeah. like new kitchens and new windows and whatever to the house and. Yeah. And not doing the 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 the, the, the more deeper um, retrofits. Eh? Yeah, the 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 yeah. upgrade works in terms of ventilation and and insulation. Now, I suppose the the slight advantage to that, and that it is slight, is the ventilation insulation knowledge back then isn't as good as what it would be now because yeah. it's now a, it's a prerequisite for nearly any house um, building project you're involved in. 
um, but it gets very complicated with older buildings because older buildings um, have survived for, particularly your house, has survived for 100 years in yeah. its current setup um, because nothing's been done to it uh, apart from finishes. Um, and you've got to you've got to consider particularly the timber in the house, which all needs to breathe. And you've got to consider the uh, the stone. It is stone work. Yeah, yeah. You've got to consider the stone external walls, uh, which also need to breathe as well because they're 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 stone work. So there's a lot of consideration before you dive straight in and adding yeah. all the modern levels of air tightness and insulation. Um, and all the modern ventilation units, good as they are for condensation internal in rooms, you could cause all kinds of difficulty with yeah. um, with existing masonry, be it stonework and uh, an existing timber work. Yeah, I suppose the end game, I suppose, what we want to reach is to get the house up to maybe over a B, hopefully, and where we can have the heating at a constant temperature all over the house. So it's very comfortable, like at the moment in the winter time. Maybe from November on, the heating has to go on. And then come next May, the heating goes off for the summer, which isn't too bad, I suppose, that six months of the year you need the heating on. But hopefully in years to come, we can get this temperature up where the house is constantly cosy, for the kids especially. And that we have the proper ventilation in the kitchen to stop the windows fogging up. Okay, <laughs> okay. So it's, it's a little bit difficult uh, with, with yeah. your young family in the current setup. Yeah. Um, and you're finding are you finding energy bills quite high? Uh, the electricity isn't too bad. Um, I suppose the home heating oil, especially with the price of the oil the way it has been in the last couple of months, has added an extra bill to the house. But overall, probably maybe a fill, a fill and a half would heat the home for the year, which I suppose in the long scheme of things isn't too bad. But it's become a bit of a juggling act at the moment to keep the house ventilated properly and trying to keep it heated properly and to keep the moisture down in the house. And how are you dealing, like how, like when you boil the potatoes, as you say, in the, in the kitchen, uh, what happens then? You, you There's steam everywhere? Yeah, you've got the two windows in the kitchen open and you there's a half door going out to the courtyard. You've got that open and you've kind of trying to <laughs> boil stuff outside, basically. So you're getting rid of the the uh, the steam and the condensation, but you're also getting rid of all the heat. Heat, yeah, yeah. Everything's gone out the window. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that's, that's, and and your and your and all the money that you're spending on your 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 oil. It's an oil system, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So like that, that's a very good analogy for the issue that you have because yeah. you have next to no ventilation. Uh, you you are inputting heat. And you've also next to no insulation, so yeah. you're not you you very little um, means of maintaining heat. Uh, you've very little means of combating condensation, um, and the only crude way you have of dealing with is what they call purge ventilation, where you're opening windows, yeah. letting out all the condensation, but also letting out all the heat. So yeah. there's a total rebalance required for, for all yeah. of that. Which I suppose is kind of what this whole podcast episode would be yeah. about, how to get all that balance right. Yeah. I suppose, like, if I was the project manager on that bill, so to speak, um, like, and you were telling me you had a budget of whatever, right? I'd say, yeah. well, look, first of all, before we spend anything on the nice kitchen, we need to get the fabric of the house right. Yeah. We need to get the um, ventilation right. We need to get the insulation right. We need to make sure there's no structural problems. We need to make sure there's no damp problems. And if there is, how do we fix them? Um, and then you're looking at air tightness. And then you're looking at putting on the basic finishes of yeah. the plaster and whatever you, um, checking all the floors for, for rot and all that. So now we have the remainder left for your kitchen and your tiles and your floors yeah. or whatever it is. Um, because you have to get the, there's no point putting in the new kitchen if the yeah. substrate behind the kitchen, the fabric of the building isn't right because then the kitchen has to come back out again. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, um, but the problem is uh, if you are a layman managing a building project, a kitchen company will not say we're not going to fit this kitchen because yeah. there isn't enough insulation in the house. You have to know that and the only yeah. way you can know that is to bring in an engineer are being an expert yourself and doing all the due diligence and, and getting advice from engineers and, and everything else. So it's easy enough for someone to make that mistake yeah. if the if the setup isn't correct day one. Um, and I suppose looking back at 2007, uh, when everyone was spending as fast as they were getting it from banks, I suppose, half the time, uh, people weren't rushing to do all that due diligence, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I suppose if you can give me a sense of what are some of the key 
problems and let's kind of discuss them. Okay, so the, the first one is probably the attic insulation. So I've done a bit of research and as to see would the uh, foam, sheep's wool or just normal rock wool insulation be the best suited for a period home. And do you need to be careful then with the way you put it on to leave the, I suppose, the roof and ventilation in the attic that it's not too airtight? Okay. Um, so do you have sloped ceilings in the first floor as well or is it all just one flat ceiling? No, it's all one flat ceiling. Okay, that makes it a lot easier, I'll be yeah. honest with you. Um, typically, what people are mostly using is either three or 400 millimetres of a quilt insulation. Uh, Rockwell do make a quilt, quilt insulation. There's other companies make it as well. Yeah. Um, people call it the, the uh, by the, the brand name, I suppose. But it's a, it's a three or 400 mil of a quilt insulation is what you need. Uh, there are I'm not overly familiar with the sheep's wool um, version of it but there are there are there are various natural products yeah. you can use as well and, and they have they have um, they have their own characteristics but certainly uh, three or four hundred mil of um, of a quilt insulation will make an immense difference yeah, yeah. to uh, to your attic um, I suppose a little bit of a question mark then I mean if you were if you were getting into a very significant project where you're doing an awful lot of uh, renovation you could argue about putting in air tightest membranes but when you're putting air tightest membranes into an yeah. old building uh, you can cause more problems than you are fixing mm -hmm. half the time because those buildings weren't designed to operate in a very airtight environment and yeah. they haven't I mean that your roof timbers have been sitting there for a hundred years in a reasonably drafty enclosure so th and they're perfectly happy with it yeah. if you suddenly started bringing in an air tightness membrane no whereas you it would help with some of your condensation issues in around the kitchen what have you because your ventilation unit would work more efficiently uh, it could cause a lot of issues for your timber so so that's a that's a very complicated um uh, um uh, uh, subject um so i would certainly put in three to four hundred mil of uh of uh, quilt insulation uh, as you rightly say then you have to make sure that uh, when you're doing all that you're still guarding and protecting the ventilation of your attic yeah. which which is all timber I mean the structure is all timber um, in an attic and you have to make sure that's fully ventilated um, was the roof ever re-slated or has it the original yeah, no I'd say the roof had been done but I'm, I'm not sure how long ago it, it looks new enough um, because like day one it was I mean I've seen photographs at the house it's a beautiful looking house and it was well built day one clearly yeah, and well yeah, yeah. designed and and there could very well even have been an architect involved day one which would have been rare enough in those days mm. um but it looks like it was well specified day one and clearly if the roof timbers have lasted for a hundred years and i'm guessing they're in reasonably good condition yeah. from, from what you know then they they have been adequately vent ventilated for most of their life yeah. um now people uh, there are various ways of ventilating a roof uh, roof space you can you can have vented slates you can have a vented roof tile and you can have vents um, along the soffit of your eaves um, which all give you a version of uh, cross ventilation from one yeah. side to the other um, any existing vents I would make sure they are maintained even up through your insulation so you keep that cross ventilation so you're ventilating the attic space you're not ventilating the yeah. first floor of your house yeah. um, which is which is which is masonry um, if you are putting in, um, like if there was a new roof installed, there's a question mark whether they maintained the original air passage that was there. I'm kind of hoping they did. If they didn't, mm. it might require a series of vent slates put into it. You'd need to check that from, yeah. you could check it from inside the attic or even maybe outside on a walk around. But um, it would be worth getting assessed to make sure it has enough ventilation. Uh, it probably does if you're saying that yeah, there's no yeah. great difficulty with the roof members to date. But uh, but but check along these because if you're pumping in insulation, uh, you, you can either put in just to add to that, you can either put in the quilt insulation uh, by hand where you buy yeah. it and just bring it up to yourself or you can get it pumped in. But either way, make sure you keep the existing uh, ventilation passages yeah. active. Very good. Uh, the other thing then was the heat recovery system. Would a period house be, could you use this in the period house? Okay, the uh, heat recovery system uh, is a is an active mechanical ventilation system, which, uh, and broadly speaking, how it works is it's drawing in um, fresh air from a series of vents that come with the system. Uh, so that's the intake, and it's using, it's expelling 
uh, stale air from from uh, the habitable rooms in your house. Yeah. And how it works is just for our listeners point of view, how it works is it removes the heat from the air it's expelling and it uses that heat to preheat the incoming fresh air. So the, even though you have a good quality of air change and air improvement, yeah. air quality improvement, you're not really uh, losing a substantial amount of heat as you do it. That's all the benefits and many new houses now have heat recovery or demand control ventilation. Um, the downside of this in a period house is you would have to make the period house very airtight and the, the difficulty of this is all of a sudden the house could react negatively to that, particularly yeah. with the, the, the timbers in your house. It could get too airtight for the timbers, which are used to uh, a lot less, uh, a lot more level of ventilation in the house, yeah. just natural ventilation. So I think if you install a full heat recovery ventilation system, it's intrusive as well in the house because like you, you'd have to find duct runs for all these pipes. So you would have to, yeah. you might have to box out ceilings. You might have to box out up uh, uh, walls trying to get from your, your attic down to your ground floor where you would have the, uh, the system um, installed and up on your first floor. So there's an awful lot of box outs required and it might look very um, unsightly by the time you've all yeah, done yeah. all that on the internal house finishes. Um, but my biggest concern would be the effect it would have when you bring your air tightness uh, so low as to accommodate the system and what difficulty that would have for the timbers of your house. You could consider installing a product called a demand control ventilation system, which is a lot less onerous in terms of air tightness. Uh, you, you could improve the air tightness locally around windows. Uh, if you're doing a bit of work on windows, but you wouldn't necessarily be installing new air tightness membranes on ceilings and yeah. on your general masonry walls. But uh, and what you would do is you would need to put in vents on your windows is one way of doing it. Mm. Uh, you can put in heat sensitive vents through walls as well, but they're a bit more unsightly. Um, I know your windows are timber, so they yeah, they could yeah. easily be reverse engineered into um, a window using a, a joiner or a carpenter. Um, so what you're doing here is the, the concept is to remove uh, some level of passive insulation, which could be through cracks in masonry or gaps yeah. in our own windows. And you probably have a fair bit of that. Yeah. But bring it down to a level that keeps the house at a reasonable level of of um, of air tightness without being too airtight to affect the timbers of the house. Um a demand control ventilation unit, how it works is in the moisture areas of your house, for example, your kitchen, yeah. for example, your bathrooms and showers and everything else. When you when there's a, a significant amount of moisture generated, for example, when you're boiling or when you're having a shower, uh, this calls on the demand control ventilation system and it brings in fresh air through the window vents Very good. Uh, and it expels the stale air. Now, it doesn't remove heat from this exchange there's no heat exchange it doesn't yeah. remove heat from the stale air and add it to the fresh air but it does give you a level of air Im quality improvement and make a big difference to your kitchen very good uh, there's another option then where you can get a single room heat con uh, heat recovery unit, which uh, I know my parents got installed in a, in a room recently in, in their house and it dramatically improved it, uh, where you can you can install this to one room and it doesn't require any pipes because you literally core a hole through the wall in one room, sh shall we say your kitchen. Yeah. You can plug it into a PowerPoint locally and you do get the heat recovery aspect, but it's only for that room. It's not for the whole house. Yeah, yeah. Um, that would dramatically improve your kitchen um, and you could play around with the air titles of your kitchen. Shall we, in your case, it's probably the um, you know plumbing and electrical uh, pipes and ducts where they go through walls, check yeah, the ceiling yeah. of those, make sure they're all sealed. Um, and have a look around your windows and maybe put a little bit of air tightness around your windows to really get the balance right. Yeah, yeah. Um, when you know the balance right because the, the, um, the ventilation unit will just be that bit more efficient, that would dramatically improve your, your kitchen. So I suppose the, the, the essence here is the ventilation units are great, but it's yeah. down to getting the right balance with air tightness. Yeah, yeah. It's all a balancing act, really. It is, certainly, <laughs> yeah. And not easy to do because yeah, you're, yeah. you're having, it's a lot of trial and error here, yeah, yeah. but you don't want to go too far with the air tightness and find out you've fixed one problem and created a load more yeah, with yeah. your timber work, you know. Yeah, I suppose the other thing we were looking at was going geothermal or air to water. But my worry is with the uh, rising cost of electricity that if we don't have this house airtight enough, our ESP bills could go through the roof. Okay, and what way are your ground floors? Are they suspended? Yeah, they're suspended floors. So we were looking at whether we go under floor heating or we just pack these up with insulating. Mm. See, it, it's a... The, the 
it's a hard balance. You, like you're getting into a more complicated balance there, you know, because like with an air to water or a geothermal unit, you need a very efficient envelope of your house, yeah. right? Um, because those systems are very efficient in themselves and they, they are they replace your gas or, or oil system, your gas or oil heating system. They are very efficient as system, systems in themselves in terms of the amount of energy they require to run them, your electrical yeah. energy. But they don't add a phenomenal amount of heat to your house. They do add yeah. some, clearly, because that's, that's what they're there for. But they're relying on the external envelope of your house to be very efficient and whatever heat they send into the house for your house to hold it. Yeah. Your biggest difficulty is once you insulate the house fine, your next biggest uh, exposure would be through the ventilation of the house, the passive ventilation yeah. that the house currently has. Now, if your floors are suspended, there's gaps between all the lovely old floorboards yeah, yeah. And, and you're losing a mountain of heat down to those gaps. Um, if you were to take out those floorboards and go into that void and install hardcore and radon and all that and put in a concrete floor with yeah. your uh, with your um, underfloor heating, which would work really well with your air to water or geothermal system, y- great. But first of all, you lose all your floors and can they be floated again over your new concrete slab? And will they be OK sitting over a underfloor heating system? They may or may yeah. not. Um, they might react very negatively to all that. Uh, is the first issue. The second issue is you're removing an awful lot of inbuilt ventilation in the house yeah. and you might again get your air tightness to too high a level, uh, which which will, yes, work very well with your new heating system, but won't work very well with the existing timber work and whatever yeah, yeah. in your house. So I think it would be a tall order and would, would nearly require a scientific uh, input, uh, more so than an engineering <laughs> input to, to get all those levels right. It may be that you're held to your existing um, gas or oil system, uh, which requires less efficiency or less primarily in, in the realm of um, of air tightness in the existing mm-hmm. house to just about work again yeah, yeah. It's sympathetically with the house, uh, or albeit maybe less sympathetic with your gas or oil bills. Um, so a, a fairly complicated, a, a long, a long, a long answer to a, maybe a short question. I think the the major problem then is the insulating. Should the house be insulated on the inside or the outside? Um, okay, the, the the pros and cons here. So is it a stone house? Yeah, yeah, for okay. black. And it, it's never been insulated on the inside no. or the outside? No. Okay. It's got a limestone render on the outside. Uh, is it a limestone or is it um, a lime render, do you know? Uh, I'd say it's just a lime render. Okay, and you still have the um, the original plaster finish on the inside as yeah. well. So I suppose, look, the the first thing we need to consider is like it's a stone building, right? So stone stonework by its very nature, and it, it differs really from block work, modern block work in yeah. this respect, is like stonework needs to ventilate. The, the actual masonry itself needs ventilation, believe it or not. Now, lime render on the outside allows for ventilation yeah. um it is it, it has it, it, it it's it doesn't seal it right so it allows for a little bit of a passive ventilation on the um on the it like the the, the wall needs to breathe and the lime render allows it to breathe on the outside uh, and your plaster surface on the inside will also let it um let it breathe so yeah. that the wall is currently breathing now External insulation is the best way to insulate the outside of a house in that your dew point is on the outside of the external insulation. Yeah. So you'll never have any problem. You can't have problems with condensation because the condensation happens outside and the wind is blowing away all the condensation. And uh, now it is the most expensive way to insulate yeah. a house, um, but it is it is like it is the, the foolproof way of doing it. Yeah. The problem about um, installing external insulation onto your house is straight away you'll be sealing the outside face of the wall because you'll probably put on the external insulation and then an acrylic render outside that. So now the outside of the wall is bulletproof, uh, the external face, but it's totally sealed. So now your stonework has to breathe inside, yeah. which might work, right? Um, but... But the, the, I prefer if your storm was breathing externally rather than breathing internally. Yeah. Um, I suppose the difficulty of uh, of adding it externally is like I mean I've seen the photographs of your house. It's a wonderful looking house, beautiful. Yeah, we don't, old don't want to destroy features. the feature on the outside. And I think you yeah. will do that by putting on the external yeah, insulation. Yeah. It'll look like a new house 
that you're trying to make look old with the old windows yeah. rather than it being genuinely an old house. Yeah. Now, if you start um, insulating it on the inside, you still have to guard, uh, well, ideally guard the uh, the the breathing, the breathability of the um, of the old stone wall internally. Uh, currently, that's that's working. Uh, it's working. Um, at a good enough level for the masonry through your existing plaster surface. Uh, if you were to add dry lining on the inside, now you d- you have the difficulty of losing features on the inside as well. Yeah. And it, and like, is there cornicing in the house? Yeah, there is. Yeah, so you have a difficulty with yeah. the cornicing. No, if the budget allows, you can get the cornicing removed and reinstalled by yeah. a specialist. Um, I know there are plenty of comp- companies in Cork who do that, and I, uh, we've done it before, right? Yeah. And, and it works fine, and you won't know it was ever done, but yeah, it's yeah. done really well. Uh, but you'd have to remove the cornicing. You'd have to stand a stud wall, um, possibly with a metal track system, uh, which will receive the new plasterboard, but uh, but it'll stand it out from the existing inside uh, face of yeah. your external walls to leave a ventilated cavity. And you'll have to uh, add some little vents in, in uh, strategic places where you won't see them mm. to allow this cavity to be vented. Um, when you stand the new stud, then you have an insulated stud wall uh, and this creates your um, your insulation layer on the inside. Now, of course, your rooms are getting smaller, mm. uh, so you're losing, you know, you could be losing 150 mil on all your external faces. You have to be comfortable with that. Yeah. And you have it'll, it'll affect, of course, any external wall is going to have a window, or most of them will have a window, so you'll have to work all your window reveals back in. Well, so would the windows be, have to be removed? Uh, not on the inside, no, but you'll probably have to redo joinery local to the windows to get yeah. them all to align with the, the um, have you weights on the windows? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. You, there's, a, there's a bit of work there now to get a good joiner to build new reveals, timber reveals to work in with your weight, your 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 reveal system so that uh, so that it looks like it was always there. It's doable. Yeah. Um, but uh, but there's a bit of work on that um, because now your now your dew point will be on the in the new cavity we've built and we're ventilating it so so yeah. we've 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 dealt with that aspect and you'll get a significant improvement on your uh, on your U value of your walls yeah, your, yeah. your insulation capacity of your walls you're probably not going to do it to full new house regulations yeah, because yeah. it'll take too much from your room and you ha- because you've all stone walls you will get a level of insulation it just by virtue of the depth of the masonry like you've so much yeah. distance between you and the externals you're probably not losing a fortune of heat through the external walls but if you felt it was really worth insulating given the 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 situation you have in the house uh, that's how I do it but I'd probably tone down the depth of the insulation yeah, yeah, yeah. because you already have some in it and uh, and you don't want to take too much from your rooms either. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, in some rooms uh, they don't lose a, a massive amount of heat. Like you put on the heat for an hour in the evening, but they do hold the heat. But then you have other rooms, then the ro- bedrooms after landing, because there's so many sash windows on the landing, all okay. the breeze is coming through and under the doors. Well, that that brings up another. Qu- I mean, is your landing f- what direction is that facing? Yeah, uh, it know? is not not facing. Okay, so you you've two things there. Like you're getting. Neglig- you're getting no solar gain through the windows in your landing. Mm. Uh, the windows have gaps, right? Um, and a window will have less uh, insulating capacity than the lovely thick stone wall nearby. Yeah. So there's a few things there. You've way too much passive ventilation because there's gaps around the windows. You're facing north anyway, so you're getting no solar gain through the windows. And windows themselves have less insulation capacity, as we said, uh, compared to, to masonry walls. Um like adding loads of insulation to your landing is really only going to help the masonry walls yeah, and improve yeah. them more again. Uh, your windows with gaps is a is a is an issue. Yeah. Um, is there a way of improving the energy efficiency of the their double glazed sash windows? But they just seem to be very airy when the wind is blowing. They seem to move um, quite considerably. You, have you any idea when the windows were installed? Uh, I think roughly around two thousand and seven as well. Okay, which isn't that long ago. Um, mm. Like if there's, because they're sash windows, the 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 double glazed uh, cells, the, gla- the glazed cells are probably quite thin um, to, to work with a sash window. Uh, and I doubt you could make them any better than they are. Yeah. Uh, you could put in new double glazed cells, but uh, to me, it, it's suggesting more that the gaps are the problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, there's a... a I have a question for you now. I don't know if you can necessarily answer it. Like, do you know if they were built in a factory or were they installed by? I'd say they were handmade. 
Okay, well that's... But the, the problem is the, the brushes are very thin on them, so I, I don't know if they can be changed or not. Okay, the answer is they can, yeah. right? Um, I worked on a protected structure building in Cork City, um, probably around 2011, uh, in the depths of the recession. But uh, uh, we were dealing with a protected structure, so all the windows were single glazed. Um, there are companies, joinery companies, that specialise in renovating windows uh, yeah. that that would have been built by another joinery company so they'll take out the sash they'll take it away they'll rework it if it needs to be reworked sometimes these can be if there's too much light hitting it yeah. uh, or if they've been if they've had too much moisture they can distort a little bit and the actual distortion can cause them not to fit snugly into the surrounds and that can cause the issue yeah. as you said sometimes the brushes can be faulty or brushes can be missing or the wrong yeah. size brushes so they can be serviced by a joinery company now it's not cheap yeah. because they'll have to take away sections of the window working it by hand take a variety of measurements and then rebuild it and come back and probably do some more work on site. Yeah. But it, like I've seen the photographs, they're beautiful looking windows. Yeah, yeah. So it'd be a shame to, 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 to not work with them. Yeah. Um, they were, it just, it's, it's a pity they didn't do what they were supposed to do, given that they're Different not demo. all that old. Yeah. I'd probably actually get a joinery company to look at them and because they'll be expert in yeah. the quality of the, uh, the glazing because they would deal in glazing as well. Yeah. Like any joinery company you deal with now is a is a joinery company who has a workshop who also regularly makes windows. So they'll be expert in the quality of the glazing because they deal in the glazing regularly. They can look at the glazing and go, to be honest, there's nothing wrong with the glazing. Yeah. That's not hugely different to what we fitted on a brand new job last yeah. week. But I can see the brushes are in big trouble. It's not a big thing to fix them. We can do it on site or yeah. we can take away various parts of the windows here and there and give you temporary covers uh, until we rework them and put them back. That's probably the approach I get a joiner to say, get a survey done, get an assessment done, give it the options. There's probably yeah. a few different price options as well. Again, I've done that myself, yeah. you know, working on a house in, in Castle Road and Black Rock uh, some years ago. That's what we did. Um, and you'll have a good sense of what needs to be done to the yeah. windows and hopefully rescue them, please God, um, uh, in, in that fashion. Yeah. You know? uh, I suppose the other question then is the extension on the back has a flat roof. And it seems to be leaking from the top. So what would be the best advice to fix the flat roof? Okay, so the extension, was it always there or was it added uh, on or do you know? I'm not 100% sure, to be honest. Does it but look like it was the same age of the house uh, or a bit it's, younger? It's kind of tied in, but it, it looks probably a bit, the plaster looks probably a bit newer, fresher on it. Okay, and there is a flat roof um, and the flat roof is leaking. Yeah. Um have you seen the surface of the flat roof like from an upstairs window or anything? Oh, from, from externally it looks perfect but up, upstairs in the extension it's a two story flat roof extension okay so upstairs it's showing a bit of mould in the corners okay but is it actually leaking? I, I'm not 100% sure but like is there any section where there's a big wet patch no no and the ceiling's the, about to come down no, and all it's, it's just where the corner is meeting the wall Okay, so what you're probably having is uh, is called bridging. So it's probably more of an insulation issue than yeah. an actual um, than an actual damp penetration or a leak uh, issue. And um, the reason, like it's it's a bit like breathing on a mirror. You're getting condensation and you're getting more dampness and mold yeah. um, on your ceiling because one area isn't insulated as good as a, 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 an area um, nearby. Uh, it could be that there's a build up of timber there and they weren't able to get insulation there. Mm. Um, now, I suppose, like, there are two ways of insulating a flat roof. You can either insulate between your joists, but again, a bit like our stud wall, we need to have a, a, a ventilated cavity above it yeah. to, to make sure we deal with the condensation. That's called a uh, cold roof and they're best avoided. Now, depending on the way your roof is exactly set up, it might be the only way to do it. Um, the other option is a warm roof where you actually add the insulation on top of the roof yeah. and put a new um, a new uh, damp proof uh, layer, which would be your, your roof covering. It could be um, a PVC covering yeah. or it could be a fiberglass covering or, um, or even a torch on felt, um, a modern uh, mineral felt um, covering. 
Uh, it depends on uh, how that flat roof is meeting the existing eaves of the house, whether yeah. you'd have enough height to do that underneath the existing eaves and how existing lead work. Um, so there are a variety of options there. Yeah. I mean, uh, you'd really need to kind of to do t- to look on top and see what the options are on top as regards height for this potential insulation or look underneath and maybe take away a section of the plaster and see what way it was insulated. Because I'd say if you open up a section that's fine inside and open up a section that has the condensation, yeah. you'd probably find out see there's the insulation in the fine area and there isn't in the other area. Um, and the reason being because it's probably congested with timber. Yeah. Now, if it's just a little bit of a gap that someone forgot to put insulation on, you can put a little bit in. But again, make sure you have the ventilation on top um, for reasons yeah. we spoke of earlier, you know. I suppose the other question then is uh, keeping the house as it is, how best to control mould issues in the house? I would propose a little bit of trial and error with adding air tightness. Yeah. Um, maybe start around the windows because the, the, those windows were new windows mm-hmm. anyway. So so the building would have been designed with an... Okay, it wasn't the building wouldn't have been heavily designed in that respect day one, but yeah. the building would have worked with the older windows and I was working with the newer windows. So... I would. I think there's nothing wrong with getting the windows reasonably well sealed. Yeah. Start there and then see how your condensation works. Uh, if you're still having condensation, you could take it up another small level and just um, get rid of some, if there's any other gaps in masonry and seal those off and then see how your, your condensation uh, works then. I suppose I, there's a part of me would be concerned with going too much further with your air tightness. Yeah. Um, it might be like if you're having particular condensation in one particular room, you could, again, the, this single room um, ventilation unit that I, that I mentioned earlier, the, the heat recovery unit, uh, they're not usually expensive, by the way, yeah. only a few hundred euros. Um, you're coring hole through a wall, you're fitting one of those, you're plugging it in. If it's in one particular room, that will fix most of those yeah. issues. So definitely in the kitchen, uh, I, there are ones that are particularly designed for bathrooms uh, they'd be well worth considering yeah, yeah. so you know you might have two grand spent by the time you have half a dozen of these yeah. throughout your house and they I, I'd probably target more locally the areas where you're having significant condensation yeah. which would probably be the areas where you're having si- significant um, moisture generation so your wet rooms I think that's probably your best bet yeah. because I think it's going to be next to impossible and every part of the house will want different levels of air tightness and you're never going to achieve that because air yeah. tightness you can put on the various measures and then you're hoping to get a certain level of air tightness it's quite easy to do in a new house because it's, yeah. it's straightforward on an old house it's next to impossible you'd nearly have to d- do up one room and see how the house reacts to it uh, yeah but 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 it'll, th- that'll react more locally in one yeah, room yeah, it, yeah. the whole house won't react to it because all the, the doors shut and stuff will, will, will change it but yeah yeah I think on the on overall what you're telling me, I would approach that with the single rooms because then you can control it room by room and your issues are probably room by room anyway. You know? Yeah, yeah. I suppose with the chimneys then, how do you ventilate the chimneys um, so that add into the moisture and the rooms? So are your chimneys active? Uh, one active chimney. In your living room? Yeah, uh, sitting room. Okay. With and the, the other ones? The active chimney in the kitchen. I'm not sure if this has been blocked up over time. And there's probably little fireplaces in bedrooms. No, I see. Uh, that's when we don't know how deep we have to go into the house. Maybe okay. when we start stripping back the house, we'll find these. No, one the, the the way to know was I mean, if you have your carpets in bedrooms or timber yeah. floors, if you lift okay. up the carpets, you might find a little concrete base in the middle of where the the timber floors are. So a little square of concrete or whatever yeah. that, that could have to turn their paint kind of pink so they look the same color <laughs> as, as the timber floor. Um, but if you have little concrete bases in the middle of your timber floor, you know, next to the wall, yeah. they often put those in to hold the fireplace uh, in the olden days. So if they took away the fireplace, they, they, they usually just leave the concrete f- uh, little um, foundation they put even on the first floor and they just carpet over so no one knows. Because I suppose they, they would have been, people kind of moved away from using those fireplaces when they had central heating systems installed. Um, because there was all the, you know, you had to lug timber and coal and whatever up, up the stairs with the, 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 the coal bucket and everything else. Um, if they aren't being used, they should be ventilated because otherwise, like if you have a fireplace, a fire, um, a flue, a chimney flue, that is sealed off on the on the ground floor or the first yeah. floor um, where the fireplace used to be and it's sealed off on the top because you don't want crows flying down your um, and, and debris um, coming down your the top of your chimney pot um, you now have a sealed 
um, flu in your house and just by the virtues of uh, an old house you can get gases leaking into that from the old yeah. house and then it can be a store of noxious gases so it should always be ventilated it ideally ventilated on the top and there yeah. should be just a vent put into it like a four inch vent put into it in the rooms just to let these things naturally vent yeah. that is always good good practice anyway and you do you, that won't, you won't get a build up of gas then yeah, you know? yeah. and you do that with the heat recovery system uh, no that, that's this is just separate. this is just a vent cover so it's a right. four inch circular hole cord through into it and there's a vent placed on it and there is a, a cowl placed on your chimney and you just let it vent away naturally yeah do you lose a tiny bit of heat you do but the last thing you want is a build up of, of noxious gases and um, now when it comes to chimneys i would get a chimney specialist because no matter how long we talk about this today uh chimneys are in my opinion chimneys, chimneys are always the um the the most complicated part of any house mm -hmm. um and and every chimney is different every there's no two chimneys i'd say were ever built that are the same and um, particularly back in the old days uh so i would definitely get a chimney specialist it is the one area that i think that specialist advice is a is a guarantee and i don't think any engineer can do it i think it's really down to yeah, a yeah. chimney specialist someone who works in chimneys all day every day has seen all the problems highly experienced and particularly with old houses yeah so i would definitely get chimney special advice for all the chimneys just one other question is the the radiators they're old cast iron radiators so i'm just wondering could this be used with the earth water system or the geothermal system um do you know if those radiators were put into the house in 2007 yeah, yeah they, they look fairly new okay so they're new radiators that look Oh, they were yeah. made to look old. Yeah, they got a vintage, so they're made to look like the old cast iron. Yeah, radiators. like the school, the schoolyard, our uh, school radiators. Yeah, so the few chunky. Yeah, the beautiful the, old yeah, looking yeah. radiators, but but yet new. Uh, so they're in good condition. Like the the when you're fitting an air to water system, if you're putting in um, if you're putting in radiators, you generally have to put in oversized radiators because um again the heat you get from an air to water system is not the same level heat that you get from a gas and oil system so they need yeah. to be either bigger steel radiators or similar sized um aluminium radiators which conduct heat more readily um i wouldn't think the cast iron or the faux cast iron radiators that were installed back in 2007 would work mm -hmm. to be honest i'd have to get advice from um the manufacturer of the uh, either the air to water system or the yeah. manufacturer of the cast iron radiator system my thoughts would be it wouldn't work because i yeah. like i just know there's a lot of and those radiators radiators may not have been adequately sized for the cubic meterage of your rooms either yeah, so yeah, there's yeah. another question mark yeah. there so so perhaps not would be my thoughts but i'd, I'd have to do a bit of kind of uh, i'd have to yeah. check it out um with the, the various manufacturers um I suppose that is the difficulty when you're, and uh, this is always a question, of course, like when you're, when you, you go into an old house and go, God, it's beautiful, it's the house of my dreams, but it's not quite working. Yeah. And, uh, and you start putting in the new things that you know will work, but A, will they work with the old building? Yeah. And B, will the building, will <laughs> the building look the same yeah. by the time it's had all this plastic surgery? Yeah. Um, so that is, that is the difficulty with these old buildings. I mean, yeah. they are gorgeous and they are, they're timeless and priceless, yeah. but uh, but of course, as you know, as you know, they can be a bottomless pit as well when you start renovating them. But but how to renovate them sympathetically, yeah. and you can't automatically default to very high levels of air tightness, yeah. uh, brand new heating systems that are designed for brand new buildings, um, and brand new ventilation systems similarly. So they need a very sympathetic approach, and sometimes it's trial and error. There's an awful lot of due diligence and a lot mm -hmm. of awful lot of head scratching and uh, and getting advice um, from the uh, from the installers of the, of the newer products and from engineers and, and what have you. Um, but look, at the end of the day, it's it's a well worthwhile exercise, yeah. um, and uh, uh, you've a bit of a journey ahead of you. Yeah, I'd say, it by it all seems comes. like a big puzzle that you just have to put piece by piece to make the jigsaw. It is. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, and uh, I, I'm hoping now that uh, having having covered most of of, uh, of of the questions as as best I can, that I've I've uh, I've put some of the center of the yeah. jigsaw together, <laughs> or maybe the outside, and you can start filling in the center. Yeah.
So that was Andy's story. Um, you, I hope you get some sense of what his house is like now. Um, some of the difficulties, of course, when you're renovating an old house, you can't go in with a sledgehammer and add every modern efficiency to it because the house just won't take it. And the house, uh, Andy's house in particular, has been operating at a certain level of heat, a certain level of air tightness and ventilation for the last uh, for the last hundred years and whereas it's happy enough in itself the way it's operating uh, it obviously isn't working just yet for, for Andy and his family uh, so he has to do some work some of it is trial and error there's no doubt particularly with respect to getting the right level of air tightness uh, small and all as it will be because we have to work with existing timbers maybe more local ventilation approach with the single room heat recovery units which may very well be the best way to do it Um and of course, getting the, uh, the the insulation right on the walls, the attic is probably a bit more straightforward um, and uh, and bringing the house up to some version of uh, of of uh, modern uh, of a modern internal climate um, to uh, to dramatically improve uh, Andy's energy bills and uh, the, the lifestyle at home. So th- there's a lot of work in it. It's very rewarding. It's very interesting work, or I think it's very interesting anyway. Um, but there's a lot of work in it. But I have no doubt when it's finished, uh, it'll be a wonderful home for Andy and his family. So uh, thank you very much for, uh, for, for watching or listening to today's podcast. And remember, if you're enjoying the podcast, please leave us a, a five-star rating if you're feeling generous. Um, and uh, we look forward to speaking to you uh, next Sunday at 8 p.m. So see you then. Mm-hmm.